we go. Well, welcome. I'm Rebecca Crane Okada. I'm the a clinical nurse specialist and the program manager here in the Margie Peterson Breast Center. And I coordinate all of the programs that support our patients in their recovery and survivorship. And one of the fun things I get to do is um, this. Uh, and today, so today the topic is mindfulness for the fall season. And uh, this will be a about 20, 25 minute presentation with questions and answers at the end. And some of you have heard some of this before. I meet with individuals one-on-one, -on -one, uh, but I also uh, would like to do more groups. So this is an opportunity to do this. This is being recorded. So please, if you ask questions, do not identify your name. And I want to acknowledge the Ken Johnson family who donated uh, money in particular for patient education in memory of Joan Briarton Johnson. So we know that cancer has many effects, uh, cancer and its treatments have many effects on the body, mind, and the spirit. And one of the things we like to emphasize here in the Breast Center is that we try to take care of the whole person, recognizing you that you're not just a body that needs physical care, but your mind needs information and understanding, and your spirit will also need attention. So when I think about cancer survivorship, I think about living in wellness with or after cancer, um, health as a wholeness and harmony in the energy or life force of the body, mind, and spirit. And that means health, uh, emotional balance, mental clarity, and spiritual well-being. Health of the body is what that really means. Uh, Rahim has said that health is being in tune with one's own soul and the spirit of nature. So I want you to just pause for a moment. You might want to close your eyes and we'll take just a few seconds, but think about whatever it is that stresses you. And my goodness, we have any number of things that can stress us, but where do you feel that stress in your body? Where does it exhibit itself? Just think about it for a minute and feel your body. Notice your body and how it responds to something stressful. I can give you suggestions, but I bet you don't have any hesitancy feeling that. Does anyone want to throw out what stress feels like in your body? Go right ahead, jump in. Oh, I would say I feel uncoordinated, like I don't have control over thing, over doing mm -hmm. things. That's great. I find that I feel it primarily in my back and my neck and shoulders. Mm. Anyone else? Those are two really good examples of how stress affects us, both in actions of our bodies, but in internal sensations such as pain or tightness or discomfort. So now we're gonna switch. I want you to think for just a few seconds. Again, just maybe close your eyes. And this one may be a little harder for some of you. Where do you feel joy? in your body? How does joy exhibit itself? I may say, uh, I feel a sense of warmth in my heart. I think. Warmth in your heart. Yeah. My uh, heartbeat seems to slow down. <laughs> That's great. Anyone else? I feel a kind of warmth in my chest. Hmm. Anyone else? 
pain, I feel it in my chest. And as soon as you said the word joy, I felt a slight smile on my face. Uh -huh. So mostly in my chest. So, so you're you're talking about things that you might, we might see in you, and we might not see, right? Anyone else? Thank you for sharing those. So, I think as women, uh, we often have trouble putting ourselves first, and we tend to put other people first, whether it's children, spouse, friends. Um, so we all have barriers to taking care of ourselves. And I have this list. I talk to nurses a lot about the barriers we have in taking care of ourselves. My guess is you can identify with many of these. Sometimes we feel like we don't have time to pause. Sometimes we feel like we don't really know how to take care of ourselves, that we, we don't have the experience or we, don't, we need some ideas of how to take care of ourselves. I think we all have been in this place where we believe everything will just work itself out. So I don't really have to stop and uh, regroup. Um, sometimes if we take time for ourselves, we fear that it may change our relationships with others. This is sometimes a, a barrier for people seeking help and counseling, because if I change, then what is it going to do my, to my relationships? Um, maybe we have a lack of support or a lack of opportunity to be uh, alone. Maybe we don't have privacy in our own homes, or maybe we don't have encouragement from those in our inner circle to really take the time. And certainly we always let priorities get in the way. And sometimes those priorities are realistically important. Uh, I think we all also face stigma. Sometimes we have this sense that we should be stronger. I shouldn't have to ask for help. I shouldn't have to seek counseling or go get a massage. I should be able to do this, or it's a sign of weakness, or my best friend didn't have this problem, so I shouldn't be having this problem. I'm sure you have other ideas of reasons that you don't put yourself first. If anyone has a pressing thought, please unmute yourself and just throw it in there. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about mindfulness and, and some strategies for self-care, whether in times of stress or conflict or just needing to step away and take care of ourselves. So mindfulness in the dictionary is defined as the practice of maintaining a non-judgmental state of heightened or complete awareness of one's thoughts emotions or experiences on a moment to moment basis. There's some key words in there, which I'm going to highlight in the next slide or two. Non-judgmental, heightened awareness, thoughts, emotions, or experiences, and in the moment. We know that there are many benefits of mindfulness. And some of these benefits are seen in research on mindfulness meditation mindfulness-based stress reduction strategies. And there are all kinds of meditation practices out there. So I'm talking about mindfulness and meditation as a collective. But we know that for the body, it can help with sleep, with fatigue, with pain or other physical symptoms. There's some beginning evidence that mindfulness may help in the immune response. And it may help with brain activity in terms of regulating emotions with attention and self-awareness. And for the mind, it has been shown to improve mood and reduce symptoms of anxiety or depression, helpful with stress or de-stressing from distress. It may help stop that ruminating that happens when, when we have a worrisome thought that just kind of runs around in our brain like um, a mouse or a rat on a treadmill, just kind of recurring thoughts that are not necessarily helpful or constructive and we can't seem to get out of. Certainly women who've had a diagnosis of breast cancer live with this fear of the cancer recurring, recurring that uncertainty about um, test results. It may help with coping, finding new ways of coping strategies for different aspects of our lives. It may help with our thought patterns. And it's certainly been shown to help with some symptoms that occur after post-traumatic 
um, with post-traumatic stress, so post-trauma experiences, which for some breast cancer um, causes. And in the spirit, it can help with compassion towards the self, empathic responses to others. It can help with relationships. It can help in integration of one's sense of spirituality and finding meaning. So when we think of the body, mind, and the spirit, we think of quality of life overall. It is all of this. It is all of us. So going to those the definition of mindfulness, I follow um, some work from my research on mindfulness and dance and movement therapy, and a wonderful paper by Shauna Shapiro uh, stressing the three principles of mindfulness, intention, attention, and attitude. And I think these are pivotal things to reflect on when one is thinking about one's practices. Intention means having a focus or a reason or an expectation for what you're about to do. So we go through life with many apparently or supposedly mindless activities. We get in our car, we drive to the grocery store, we have an intention of buying some groceries, but we don't, don't always pay attention to the little steps along the way. Now, I wouldn't say that that is necessarily a mindful activity, but it could be if we were taking time to notice what surfaces as we are preparing to leave for the grocery store. So in a mindful practice, we might be thinking about um, how we're going to sit still for five minutes today and we're going to pay attention to the breath. And that's all we're going to do. We're not going to worry about how well we do it, how poorly we do it. We're just going to say, I'm going to sit still for five minutes today. And that's my intention. It might be a more expansive uh, intention to learn something, to notice something, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then attention is having an awareness of what's going on from moment to moment. So paying attention, noticing. And then attitude is this non-judgmental attitude of acceptance and openness. Um, this is really hard for many of us to do, especially when we're learning something or doing something new that we might think has a certain way of needing to be done and we're not doing it right or correctly or whatever words we can use to say it's not quite right. So we want to try and keep an attitude of non-judgment, of gentleness towards ourselves, of kindness and trusting ourselves, of being curious and not striving, letting go of this need to achieve which again is hard in our society to do. So a broader definition again of mindfulness is paying attention on purpose in a particular way. So there are many avenues to being mindful. Some of these are listed on this slide and many of you have experienced them. I know one person on this slide writes poetry. Poetry actually is not listed here, but that can be a great integration of mind and body. Prayer or other spiritual and religious practices can be mindful practices. Walking the labyrinth, deep breathing, use of essential oils or aromatherapy, massage, relaxation, music and singing, dance and movement, acupressure, acupuncture, hypnotherapy, tai chi and qigong, which are also movements that are meditative, reiki, healing or therapeutic touch, yoga, and I'm going to show you today the emotional freedom technique or tapping. So again, I think it goes back to this other slide, which is paying attention on purpose in a particular way, having an intention, paying attention and having a non-judgmental but curious attitude, you can apply that to any of these practices. Becky, can yes. you say a little bit more about the labyrinth and how that applies to us? I don't know. Yeah, the labyrinth, if you aren't aware, is different from a maze. 
uh, a maze is intended to confuse and challenge you to find your way out once you enter this uh, structure. A labyrinth is one way in and one way out. And these are ancient, ancient uh, structures that were often created out of stone in the ground. Um, there are some that are created out of hedges and bushes and trees. Um, there are several around the city, and if you would like more information, I can get that to you. Many of them are used as a prayerful walk. Some are just used as a spiritual practice with the intent of allowing you to walk, knowing that you have this structure to guide you in and a path to guide you out. And some of the techniques with that are to stop and breathe and set an intention for whether it's, I want to walk this path today to just relax. I want to walk this path to see what God has to tell me. I want to walk this path and just try and be quiet and still and focus on my breathing. So the idea sometimes is walking in and releasing or letting go of the burdens that we carry, going in the center and staying there and maybe saying a prayer, doing a salutation to the sun, uh, say, taking a deep breath and allowing to, anything to enter. And then as you walk out, it is integrating what has surfaced for you. For some, this can be a very deeply meaningful experience. For others, it's just simply a way to have a structured walk that is relaxing. Because once you enter, you will come out. So it's a lovely device or tool for walking in a guided, safe way. So we're going to do a brief breath work session and I'll just ask you to put your pens and pencils down. The Persian poet Rumi says that sometimes we have to close both eyes to see with the other eye. So in these few, a couple of minutes, I'm just gonna ask you to uh, place your hands either in your lap or on your lower belly. And if you're comfortable, I'm assuming you're in a safe space and you're seated comfortably. So simply notice your breath. Perhaps you breathe gently in and out and notice your shoulders rising and dropping and your belly rising and falling. And simply notice your breath. Sometimes our breath is guarded because we're self-conscious. Sometimes the breath is shallow because we're tense. Sometimes the breath is deep. We're scattered because we're tired. One technique is to simply breathe in gently what you need and release what you don't need. Breathe in ease and breathe out worry. Sometimes as you practice this breath in and breath out, you find that your breath slows down and becomes more evenly paced. Some people will count, for example, breath in, two, three, four, and breath out, two, three, four. There are many techniques for breathing and part of the joy is to find the one that is right for you. So I'll ask you to take another deep breath in and let it out slowly. And breathe in once more and let it out slowly. And if your eyes were closed, open them and simply return to this space with everyone else.
I'm going to talk to you now about another technique and I'll incorporate the breath work and the body scan right before we do that. Capacitar is an international organization founded to empower connection to our own energy and wisdom through a multicultural lay education program and to develop practices and share those with the world to help us re rebalance depleted energy and restore that sense of energy and nourishment that we all need living through our lives. And if you think of the body as an energy system, the body, mind, and spirit, we can get easily imbalanced by whether it's physical trauma, physical illness, emotions or trauma that's held in the body, or other stressors that we encounter in our daily lives. Um, the model is based on the body as a series of energy fields, which are associated with major organs and aligned with the meridians. In East-West medicine, we tend not in Western medicine to talk about this as much, but in Eastern medicine, we think more about these meridians and the energy fields and blocked energy. So the emotional freedom technique was one designed to unblock these energy fields by tapping on what we know as acupressure points that help release this blocked energy. Connected with these channels or meridians, we are tapping on those fields to release the energy. I want to reflect back on where you felt body changes with stress or with joy. We want more of those joy balances with the tension and irregularities that we feel in our body with stress. When you were breathing, did you notice any tension in your body as you were breathing? Because another technique is to breathe into that area of tension and then release it with each out breath. So if you felt tension in your shoulders or your back, you would simply breathe into those areas and release that tension with each out breath. So the breath in and the breath out is a grounding exercise. The breath into the body where there is tension and the release out is another way of rebalancing. I see a couple of you trying that right now. So we're going to try this tapping exercise. And one thing to do is to think about the stressor in your body and to give it a number. If you were to imagine right now in your body, if there's a stressor, if you rated it on a scale of zero to 10, what would it be before you start doing this exercise? We're going to be using the pads of our fingers, probably just two or three fingers of each hand. And we're going to be tapping on these acupressure points on the face, above the upper lip, below the lower lip, to the sides, and I'll stand up so you can see that and beneath our collarbones. And as we do so, I'm going to coach you to breathe because the exercise you just did with breathing has to be incorporated. And when we learn something new, we tend to hold our breath. So I'm going to coach you on the breathing. So again, the exercise is from the emotional freedom technique developed by Gary Craig and designed simply in this exercise to tap on some of these meridians to release blocked energy. So if you have a number for the stress in mind, just hold it in your head and begin by breathing and tapping gently above your eyebrows. And you're not tapping hard, you're simply tapping lightly. As you breathe gently in and out, then you're moving to the sides of your eyes in that little hollow, tapping gently as you breathe gently in and out. 
and then tapping beneath your eyes at the top of that bone. Again, still breathing gently in and out. And then with one hand above your upper lip, one hand beneath your lip. And then we're doing this to our sides, around, around the base of your bra line. And I use my thumb or you can use your middle finger knuckle and you're just tapping there. And often that's tender, maybe a little sore. That's not unusual. Dropping your shoulders down and breathing gently in and out. And then you're tapping beneath the collarbones here. As you breathe gently in and out. And then you're going to tap to the side of one hand, just like this. And as you tap to the side of your hand, you're going to say to yourself quietly, in spite of the fact I have this stressor that's affecting my body, I'm okay. I accept myself. And then you're going to rest your hands and breathe. We're going to repeat it one more time right now because we don't get to practice this like I would if I was meeting with you in person. But we'll begin again just for a refresher right above your eyes, just tapping gently and breathing to the sides of your eyes, beneath your eyes, above one lip, your upper lip with one hand, beneath your lower lip. Still breathing to your sides. Still breathing. And then beneath your collarbones. Still breathing. And then to the side of one hand, doesn't matter which hand and saying quietly to yourself, in spite of the fact I have this stressor, I'm okay, I accept myself, and rest and breathe. Now, if you like that, that's a technique you can repeat over and over again. Some people will use that many times to relax. Uh, it can be helpful when you're having trouble sleeping. I'm happy to share the instructions with any of you in writing. And I've recorded that where I can share it with you. Um, but it's a technique that people, a lot of people like and use. If I were to meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, we could do a guided imagery and a visualization um, and do a longer meditation where you practice really allowing your mind to relax more. And then another technique we can talk about at another time is finger holds, where this is meditating and holding the finger while releasing the negative emotion associated with that finger and allowing it to leave the body and release. Again, this is a capacitor technique, uh, and I'm happy to share that with you at another time. So I'd like to close this time with a meditation from the Meta Institute. I love this because I think it's a mantra or in other words, a saying that we can say over and over to ourselves. May I be happy. May I be well. May I be safe. May I be peaceful and at ease. So I'd like to open it to questions. Any comments or questions from the group? Thank you for your attention. I would like a copy of the image of a hand with the fingers. Uh, okay, I'm happy to send it to you. Thank you. I'll send all of these to all of you. Thank you, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Anything you've struggled with? Um, 
I hope you get to practice some of these techniques. They're, they're useful devices. Um, and reach out to me if I can be of additional support. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. I have one question. Mm -hmm. Amazing about sleeping at night. I seem to wake up and lots of thoughts just go through my head, which I cannot seem to calm down. So I have found that that just focusing on breathing seems to help. But if there's other techniques that you think of. I think that's a great one. I think sometimes when our mind is running, it's hard to get ourselves to stop thinking. Um, sometimes mindfulness apps that do a guided meditation that's spoken will help with that. I do think the tapping is helpful. Um, I do think the finger holds can be helpful uh, because it's the thoughts that keep running around that are hard to stifle. So sometimes doing something physical with the tapping or the finger holds may help, but also listening to a guided meditation may help where you hear the voice of someone else speaking or music. Yeah, I do that uh, at night. I get my cell phone, put it on airplane mode and listen to soft music. And I realize after about 30, 40 minutes, I do fall asleep to that much. Yeah, I think that's Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Okay, we'll say adios. <laughs> Bye for now.